Hello everyone, welcome to another session of chemistry. In this one we're going to be looking at bromine, the history of it, some interesting stories and some really unusual things that you can do with it. Okay then, we are still working on the same specification reference, but we are looking at how that applies to bromine. The explanation with the necessary information of the chemical processes occurring during the extraction of halogens from minerals in the sea. As I said, today we are focusing on bromine. Those of you who I have an Edmodo, hopefully you've had a chance already to have a think about this and share any ideas that you already know about bromine. In the review webinar that will take place after this session, we'll share some of these ideas that you lot already know about bromine. Okay, uh, as I said, there's something a little bit strange about bromine, uh, and this is it. Um, in the previous video, I mentioned the Dead Sea. This guy in here is actually floating in something called the Dead Sea. Now, the irritating thing about the Dead Sea, it is neither dead or a sea. But there is something very unusual and something very unique that does happen there. The clip listed here at the bottom and up on the right hand side with a little information card is accessible. But for now, I'll just give you a quick demo of what the Dead Sea can do. So this guy here, he is in the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea. And he's trying to sit up in it, as you can see, but he can't. He can try and put his feet down, but it's not going to work. All that you can do in the Dead Sea is float. There are loads of videos like these on YouTube. Here we go. He's trying to stand up and just he can't. The reason why he can't is because the sea here, well, not the sea, the water is so densely packed with the minerals such as our halides that you cannot put your feet down very easily at all. So where actually is the Dead Sea? Um, well, not close by. So I've just gone to Google Maps and typed in the Dead Sea. You can do this at your own time as well. Uh, you can see here it's in Israel. In fact, it's there we go, just on the border there between Israel and Jordan, not too far from Jerusalem. Now you can see again this idea of it being called the Dead Sea is a completely false idea because there is the sea uh, and there is no connection to that. I mean, there might be tiny little, little streams and things, but even zoomed in here, you can't see that particularly well at all. So this is actually not the sea. It is a lake, a salt water lake. In fact, one of the most densely packed salt water lakes in the world. And if you have a look on Google Images, you can see something a little bit strange here. These do not look like natural formations. In nature, we very rarely find something quite as neat as that. And that is because it's not naturally occurring. So these have been deliberately separated into different salt flats to help the nearby chemical industry to actually extract the salts from the salt water. Let's just have a little peek at what it looks like up close. There we go. So you can see here, it does look like you're looking out into the ocean, but you're not. You're looking out onto a lake. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer. There we go. That's as close as I can get for now. Oh, here we go. Let's go around this way a little bit. So I think that's as close as I can get. So on the shoreline just there, you can see an extra sort of layer of white something. Okay. Now that extra layer of white, those are deposits of the salts. 
Now I could quite happily play with this in Google Maps for absolutely ages, uh, but I'll not waste your time with that. If you want to play with that more, you are very, very welcome to. So Google Maps, the Dead Sea. Uh, and there's some great videos on YouTube of people experimenting with the Dead Sea as well. Uh, there's one, in fact, that investigates will a bowling ball sink or float in the Dead Sea? Um, check it out. It's really interesting. So here's a better look at the salts that are formed here. So all along this beach strip, it is actually a beach strip. There are tourist resorts along there, um, obviously, because there's a bit of a unique phenomenon here with the idea that you can float on it so easily but you can see all this white build up here these are all salts that have just dried out on the side now knowing that it is so rich in salts the chemical industry realized pretty quickly that actually we could use these salts for a better function so back in 1930 uh, a company was established a very creative name, uh, the Dead Sea Bromine Company Limited, okay, does what it says on the label. Uh, and this company, as I said, has been around since about the 1930s, and they specialise in extracting bromine from the salts in the Dead Sea. And just as I mentioned before, when we were still playing around on Google Maps, here there are the evaporation ponds, and just at the very end here is their factory. So, how do they actually get the bromine out of the water? Well, the extraction process depends on how large scale you are going. If we were to do this in a classroom situation, we would do what is called a small scale extraction. And a small scale extraction of bromine is very easy to do and it is very simply done as a displacement reaction. On your screen at the minute, there is the ionic equation for this displacement reaction. Have a go at the task below and I'll show you the answers in a moment. Okay then, hopefully you've had a go at those questions. Let's have a look at the answers. The two half equations. So we're going to take the chlorine in its diatomic elemental form and it is converted into chloride, Cl minus, making sure to exaggerate the L's there so that they don't look like I's. On the left hand side we've got two atoms of chlorine so on the right hand side we need two atoms of chloride so let's just pop two there to balance it on the left hand side there is zero charge on the right hand side there's two lots of negative charge so we need to give them two lots of negative charge on the left hand side which we do in the form of two electrons there the other equation that we've got we have got bromide in its ionic form, so that would be locked up in some sort of inorganic compound, some salt, for example, sodium bromide. So bromide ion there, and that is being converted to its diatomic elemental form. There's two lots of bromine on the right hand side, so there needs to be two lots of bromide on the left hand side. There's two lots of minus charge on the left hand side, there needs to be two lots of minus charge on the right hand side. Question two. Identify which ion is oxidized and which is reduced and justify, now this is where we have to be careful, justify in terms of oxidation number. So when we're talking about if something has been oxidized or reduced, you can talk about it in terms of what has happened to the electrons, what has happened in terms of quantity of oxygen, and you can also talk about it in terms of oxidation number. In this one, they have specified they want it as oxidation number. So let's assign oxidation numbers to everything here. I'll start with this top equation. So chlorine has an oxidation state of zero because it's in an elemental form. This chloride ion, each chloride ion, has an oxidation state or oxidation number of minus one. To go from zero to minus one is a decrease, therefore this half equation shows reduction. Underneath, the bromide ion on the left has an oxidation state of minus one for each bromide ion there. And it's going to be converted to its diatomic elemental form, which is always going to have an oxidation state of zero. So this has gone from minus one to zero. That is an increase. Therefore, that is oxidation. 
So the bromide ions have been oxidized, the chlorine molecule has been reduced. So let's justify that properly in terms of oxidation numbers there. So let's say Let's label this as A and B. So in equation A, oxidation number decreases. So this is reduction. Whereas in Equation B, oxidation number, that's just a shorthand way of doing that, or a lazy way of doing that at very least. Oxidation number increases, you can get specific if you want, you can say from minus one to zero, or it has an oxidation number increase of plus one. So this is oxidation, or the bromide ions have been oxidized. Question three, a very common sort of thing in these questions is first off, do half equations just like we've done, state what's been oxidised, state what's been reduced and then identify the oxidising and reducing agent. And just like we did when we were back in lesson, all this is, is whichever thing has been reduced is the oxidising agent, whichever has been oxidised is the reducing agent. So which is the oxidising agent? So in equation A, reduction has taken place so that means the oxidizing agent there is there and in here oxidation has taken place so that means we've got our reducing agent here so let's get nice and specific so uh the cl2 because that is the thing that has been reduced is the oxidizing agent and BR minus, so it's this bit here. If this was a full written equation rather than ionic or half equations, you could actually put back in the spectators here and you could set, state that uh, that's the bromide ions from the, and then name whatever compound it in, so sodium bromide. It's the bromide ions in the sodium bromide that act as the reducing agent. Okay, question sorted. Let's carry on with the lesson content. Okay, so that is the small scale, very straightforward, easy to do. We could do it in a test tube in the science labs. However, on an industrial scale, that would be inefficient and very, very slow. Time is money, so on an industrial scale, we need it bigger, we need it better, we need it faster to maximize profits. So what we're going to do here, there is going to be a big diagram. You are very welcome to do this as I do it on the screen or write it up a little bit later. Okay, so this is how bromine is extracted on the industrial scale. You have a reaction column. So the reaction column will contain the raw materials and it is also paired with a steaming out tower. So what they will do is get an inlet from the Dead Sea potentially and bring in some of the seawater solution. It is warmed gently and it is rich in bromide ions. As it's a steaming out tower, uh, obviously we're going to need some steam. So here's water as a gas, steam. We're putting in some chlorine here. Now the chlorine gas, in a similar way to the small scale extraction, is going to be used as a displacing agent here. Now, within these diagrams, what I'm going to do is if there are uh, negative aspects of this, I'm going to highlight those in red. So a waste product of this is acidic effluent solution. Um, that's not nice. Uh, effluent just is like waste water. So it, if a sewage pipe leaks, it's leaking effluent water. Um, not particularly pleasant basically and if you add acidic to that as well that's very unpleasant so that's not particularly good but what happens in that process they all combine together uh, so we've got the chlorine the bromine and some water 
Now, this is a continuous process, so more and more of this is going to be produced as it goes, but that's the main output that we are getting here. At this point, we need to extract them from each other, so we need to put them through a condenser. Chlorine, bromine and water all have different boiling points. Therefore, they're going to go from a gas to a liquid at different specific temperatures. The condenser leads to a separator. We can see here the bromine, sort of brown bit, sinks down to the bottom. Any leftover water is simply run off the top and is collected and fed back in here. So this is a great example of recycling within a chemical process. The bromine is taken out. Now the bromine there still might have some chlorine present. So what they have to do is distill it to separate the chlorine, the residual chlorine from the bromine. So that chlorine is no longer needed, so what they could do if they were particularly wasteful would be to let that chlorine escape. However, that is not what happens. What they do is another example of recycling. The unused chlorine is fed back in through here to recontinue this process. The bromine that comes out at this point is called damp bromine, so there is a little bit of water left. So what we have to do is put it through a dryer. Now, I do not mean a tumble dryer. I do not mean a hair dryer. I mean a chemical dryer. And the chemical drying agent that they use is 98% sulfuric acid. That's pretty dangerous. Um, that is very, very, very concentrated. So what that will do is any water that is present will be absorbed into that solution to form an aqueous sulfuric acid solution. So our input there is sulfuric acid and our output is a slightly more dilute sulfuric acid. Which again, if you let that go to waste, that is not a great idea. Sulfuric acid will um, get into waterways. When sulfur gets into the environment, it's a very bad idea, okay? So this sulfuric acid dissolved into waterways is going to acidify any waterways that are there, which is going to be particularly unpleasant for any organisms that live there. But in addition to this, uh, if it evaporates, it could then refall as acid rain. So what we can actually do to reduce the impact of this damage, what we can do instead is not let it escape into the environment. You can evaporate any residual water to once again increase the concentration of the sulfuric acid because there'll be less water molecules present, there'll be more acidic molecules present, so you're increasing the concentration there. So once again, another nice example of recycling within this process. And then at the bottom of the dryer, out comes the pure bromine. The pure bromine is then taken off in lead pipes. Lead is extremely unreactive. Sent off to the different parts of the factory and then a way to be made into different products in the chemical industry. Okay, so a few different processes going on there. I've only sort of touched upon the theory of this. Uh, there is more to it. If you want to read more, I can send you an extra PowerPoint on it. Um, but that's all that we need for the sake of this course. Later on in this unit, we'll be talking about a concept called green chemistry. And green chemistry is how the chemical industry can basically be better. And this process has some great ideals from green chemistry. We'll come back to that later on in this unit. Okay, so that was a quick whistle-stop tour of the history of bromine and where we get it from, both on the small scale and in the industrial scale. For my students, keep your eyes peeled on your Edmodo account. I will be sending you some exam questions on bromine and its extraction and just how it comes up on an exam situation. Story time! Bet you missed story time from lesson. Uh, story time. Back in olden days, aye, back in olden days, uh, there's a story, uh, I'm not sure how true the story is, but it's a good story, uh, of an interesting use of bromine. So back in the olden days, 
um, when the fishwives and the navy wives and basically the wives of men who went out to sea, um, they stayed at home, they looked after the kids or did whatever it is that they did. The men went off to sea and some of the men who went off to sea were not particularly loyal. Uh, there's an old saying that they've got a girlfriend in every port and, and that could potentially be true. So some of these men went around having a great time in the different ports that they stayed at. Now, some of the fishwives and the army wives and the ladies stuck at home, they realised this. They heard about this from just stories. And so what they started doing is giving the men, before they went off to sea, some bromine. So they'd slip a bit of bromine into the cup of tea before they went off to sea. Now, we all know that the halogens are toxic. OK, so that's probably not a great idea to put in somebody's cup of tea. And I strongly advise you against doing that. Do not do that at home. Um, but what they found it did is. How can I put this delicately? It prevented the gentleman rising to occasion. Yeah, bad times, bad times. Uh, I don't believe the effects were permanent, but honestly, I've never experimented with it. So uh, giving halogens to anybody has never been on the top of my to-do list. I don't really like bromine. Um, some of you have heard the story of my incident with bromine at the university. Uh, short version of the story. There was a big flask that said, do not remove from fume cupboard. I accidentally removed it from the fume cupboard and it went straight up in my face and it stunk. Oh, horrible. Hate the smell of the halogens. Story time over. That'll do for now, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Um, and next time we'll be reviewing this and then talking about chlorine. Where did we get chlorine from? How is that extracted? And then after that, we're going to be looking at green chemistry. So how the chemical industry can reduce their impact on the environment whilst also maintaining profits.